Hello and welcome to the Majlis, the podcast by Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, your host here in Washington, D.C. It's been 20 years since the peace accord was signed in Tajikistan, ending the five years bloody civil war. 20 years on since then. What is the legacy of the war and of the peace accord in today's Tajikistan? On today's Majlis, we have two simple questions to discuss the war and its legacy and peace accord in its implications, in the light of which we will also briefly touch upon current situation and the country's future. With this, uh, let's welcome our guests today. From New York, I'm joined by Dr. Edward Lemon, a Tajikistan researcher and postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Dr. Noruz Nekt Bakhshoyev, a visiting scholar at the Russian and Eastern European Institute at uh, Indiana University. Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlak Awazi, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberties, a blog on Central Asia. Welcome on board, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Very nice to have you. Uh, Norus, uh, let's start with you. Uh, take us through the old days, early 90s, leading to the days when this war erupted. How was Tajikistan looked like then? So it's now kind of a common narrative that, you know, the uh, opposition forces, basically the civil war kind of uh, destroyed the country. And as if prior to the, the war, there weren't any contradictions or like political disagreements. But political disagreements were always there under the Soviet Union because of, you know, inequalities that the economic structure back then created. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, you had these different political movements that originated in different regions. They tried to kind of mobilize to air their grievances. And this uh, polarization eventually escalated in the civil war that, you know, in 1992, you have basically the onset of this war that kind of lasted officially until uh, 1997. So uh, the basic participants in the war were main regional groupings, like you had all factions or mm. clan-like organizations. Yeah. Noruz, let's get into that a little bit later. Before that, Edward, I want you to jump in here. Noruz just led us to the way things have started. What was the tipping point which led to this eruption of this full-scale civil war? Yes, yeah, so you had these two sort of situations in the spring of 1992 where you had two opposing camps of protesters. Um, one group of whom sort of supported the uh, incumbent government um, under Rahman Nabiya, supported sort of the continuance of the status quo. And they were supported by these sort of groups from, from Kulob and from Leninabad, which is now Kujand, so the north of the country, which had been the sort of dominant force in you know, Republican politics. So you had those on the one hand, and on the other hand, you had a sort of loose coalition of, of people who were calling for a sort of Islam to play a greater role in the state, those who were calling for a more democratic, open government, uh, people from the Pamir and people from Agam, east of the country. And really, accounts differ, but the seeming spark for the onset of violence was the arming of the pro-government protesters by the government itself in May 1992. Um, now, some accounts say that the opposition themselves at that point were already armed and they responded violently themselves. Other people say that uh, it was the, you know, the pro-government forces that started but either, either way, basically, in May 1992, um, you had a situation where armed struggle sort of ensued. Okay, Bruce, now fighting has started. What happened in the war? Well, Edward covered, uh, and now Bruce, too, kind of how it started. And st- uh, there was a lot of a lot of different things in play that had, that had already been there. Uh, you know, another one was that uh, uh, during the years of the, certainly the last two decades, when Tajikistan mm-hmm. was part of the Soviet Union, they had a program where they had moved people around in the country. So they had taken them out of their traditional areas of the country and moved them to other areas, mostly for agricultural purposes. But it also had an, uh, the effect of, like, kind of breaking down uh, any kind of tribalism or, or you know, uh, sense of, of ancient community or something like that. So when, you know, when, when I, everything started to fall apart, then these divisions like came to the surface. People were resentful that they'd had other groups come into what they considered their land and, and settled there and they, they tried to kick them out forcibly. And, and so you ended up, the two groups, the anti-government group became mm-hmm. the United Tajik Opposition. Uh, it was the Islamic Renaissance Party, the Democratic Party of Tajikistan, the Lay Badakhshan. Uh, there was a couple other groups that were involved in this too. And they were pushed out away from the capital, but they, they reformed, especially in the mountains east of Tajikistan. And th- that started the war. Now, Brahman wasn't the president at that time. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, they went through after an abia, but it had, I think, two other people before they finally got to Rahman. But the government was in a pretty weak position. They could count somewhat on the Russian troops that were still there in the country, the 201st Division and Russian border guards that were along the border. But Moscow really didn't want to get involved in this. And I don't think that the feeling in Moscow was that this would get so out of hand as it did. So the Tajik government had to rely on, on other groups to support them. At first, they became this group called the Popular Front, and they had their own militias. And they're actually the ones that ended up putting Rahman in power at the end of 1992. So you had this, this mixture of all kinds of people with all kinds of different really goals and motivations in Tajikistan, uh, some that were dispossessed or, or felt they had been marginalized and they, they kind of uh, gravitated toward the opposition forces, and then some who were sort of opportunists, I suppose, who gave kind of vague oaths to, mm. to help the government out. In the meantime, they kind of carried out their own local policies. I mean, Sangak Safarov, is, for instance, is, is an infamous figure. He had uh, so much power for a while until he was killed. Uh, by one of his own deputies, that um, he could pretty much order around the Tajik government as he wanted. And there were other figures throughout the Civil War who took this, who had that uh, similar roles, where they, they had accumulated so much power that they were actually able to dictate policy to the to the government in uh, in Dushan Bay, you know, well after Rahman had been in, uh, installed in a position of leadership. So, you know, a, a variety of interests, old vendettas, there was all kinds of things just kind of came together. And, and, you know, as we heard, Tajikistan was not in great economic shape to start mm-hmm. with. So um, once the Civil War started, everything just seemed to fall apart. There was knock-on effects all over the place on the health system, the education system, everything, especially in the mountains just to the east of, Taj- of Dushan Bay, 80, 100 kilometers or something. It just turned into a meat grinder uh, where they fought and fought, and weapons seemed to be in great supply, so there was no way to really stop them, despite uh, numerous efforts at ceasefires and peace talks that started in 1994. It just kind of went on and on. Hmm. Tens of thousands of people killed, obviously. How bad the war was? Bruce, uh, Navruz, jump in. Feel free. It's an open question. I'll let Navruz go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these figures are staggering. Like, you know, I mean, it's an official account. You know, it's like 100,000 and um, and so many people were displaced. I mean, it, it's generally, you know, the legacies will be felt throughout because you have a generation, next generation that, you know, maybe lost their parents and uh, it created massive, you know, social dislocations. And then the psychological scar of the war is mm. still there. At least that's what I know through my fieldwork's research. I mean, they tried to kind of uh, keep it to themselves, they, all these pressures, but uh, given that there wasn't really a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of sorts that we observed in other post-conflict societies, and then people tend to deal with it, to cope with it. But I mean, even though it's a purely private psychological issue, I think the social issues continue to be felt. Like I said, you have a generation who grew up without, you know, parents and you have single parent households exacerbated by rural out migration as well. Hmm. Finally, after five years of this uh, disastrous war, the war ended. Tell us, please, uh, Edward, how did this happen? So, yeah, so after the most intense fighting it finished in 1993, the war did drag on for another four years. And there were numerous efforts, as Bruce said, at sort of brokering ceasefires. But there are a number of sort of commanders who continued to sort of resist efforts to be brought to the sort of negotiation table. And in the end, sort of the, the peace accord was signed um, after a sort of process of shuttle diplomacy involving the UN, involving Russia, and involving Iran, sort of Russia, sort of pressurizing Rahman to sort of end the conflict and, and sort of uh, negotiate with the opposition, whereas Iran sort of obviously was pressurizing the uh, United Tajik opposition because they had closer links with Iran. So yeah, so it was sort of a, a process by which uh, both parties sort of ran out of steam in many ways and, and peace became probably in both parties' interests and they were supported by uh, outside powers. Hmm. Can I jump in with one more comment yeah, too? Sure. Because yeah, I mean, certainly the the big powers that were trying to broker the peace, uh, be, that being Moscow and Tehran, were were both pushing them. But uh, another catalyst toward the the peace process was the uh, capture of Kabul by the Taliban in in late hmm. September 1996 too, which really kind of got got activity going a lot faster again because remember we had by that time there was certainly tens of thousands of of Tajik refugees that had crossed the border into Afghanistan even the Islamic Renaissance Party the the main wing of the United Tajik opposition didn't have very good contacts with the Taliban and didn't support their particular style of Islam either and there was a lot of fears in Moscow uh, and certainly among the other Central Asian states that that as the Taliban were advancing north uh, you know that this was the bigger problem and there really it was time to solve the Tajik civil 
civil war because something worse was coming from the south already. So that was mm -hmm. another element that kind of drove the the parties at the peace table to try to reach some kind of agreement as as quickly as they could. Mm. As for my humble understanding, uh, I think the opposition parties, uh, first and foremost, the Islamic party, they also failed to show the strength. I mean, their objective was take over the regime. They couldn't do that. What was the reason of their failure? Why did they fail to take over the regime if that was the intention? Well, I mean, it's... Uh Political uh, climate in Tajikistan, I mean, it emerged from the collapse of the former you know, Soviet Union, 75 years under the Soviet Union. You cannot assume that the entire society is, has become sympathetic to Islamic cause. Hmm. I mean, they did have, the political party had its own, like, power base in certain regions, but that didn't necessarily translate into the into the entire country. Hmm. With that being said, I mean, obviously, it's really hard to, to judge with any uh, sense of accuracy, the exact uh, level of support each particular party had because of this, you know, elections in Tajikistan, fraudulent elections are uh, basically the norm rather than the exception. So, but if you talk about its ongoing failures to become, to consolidate itself, I mean, it has to do with also with government, you know, uh, manipulation of elections, with government, you know, uh, repressive tactics, but also, you know, the inability of the opposition party to kind of uh, constantly be in touch with its base. It seems to me that they got too complacent over time, you know, once, especially certain factions of the uh, opposition, they got too tempted to join the government and then kind of got disconnected. But as far as uh, for the leadership of the, the Islamic party, I think they also became too complacent and they didn't want to upset the status quo. And the status quo was that they, they were a buffer between the regime and the extremist wing of the opposition. So they always kind of tried to portray themselves as this uh, vital buffer. And the status quo was in their best interest. And you could actually I get that sense from multiple statements by the by the leadership of this political party of the Islamic political party that we are here for patience we we are here for the stability of the nation for us the sovereignty of the nation is all that counts I mean it wasn't about promoting democracy or it was about preserving the statehood and making sure that you know the country doesn't slide back to violence so the status quo was in their favor and probably that's one of the reasons why it didn't gain traction in the imagination of most of its followers who wanted more radical action more radical in the sense of like, you know, taking bolder political steps. And maybe they became more disenchanted. And actually one of the greatest outcomes that actually defied the expectations of many analysts was that right after the, I guess I'm jumping too ahead, uh, right after the political party was banned, nothing really happened. So the expectation was that once, you know, the regime closed down the, the political party, you mm -hmm. would expect, you know, massive riots and revolts because, you know, the only official outlet has been like shut. But nothing happened. Hmm. Basically, the regime is still in place and there is no trace of any uh, political activity. So it goes to say, in my opinion, that part of the reason is that we tried to treat this, you know, uh, Islamic revival party as a monolith, as a monolith unit, but it, which it wasn't. I think disagreements and discords within the party, to some extent, prevented it from, you know, becoming a viable political party capable of, you know, taking the reins of government in addition to government suppression. Mm -hmm. Edward, maybe you would like to uh, comment on this, the, the reason of the failure of the opposition party then to take over the government. What was that? Yeah, I think if we're talking about during the civil war itself, I think, I guess as Matt Cruz has just said, you know, I think it was the fact that they, well, firstly, as, as Andrew said, they couldn't sort of generate enough sort of popular support. You know, their support bases were largely amongst the Ghani population, which, you know, doesn't form a majority uh, in the country. You know, they had some support in certain parts of the north of the country, Asparra, for example, but they didn't really have enough support. At the same time, popular front, the government, pro-government forces, enjoyed the support of Uzbekistan and Russia, as well as having their own militias. So, you know, if we're talking about militarily at the time, United Tajik opposition were sort of pushed into Afghanistan and then had to sort of launch sporadic attacks from there from sort of 1993 onwards. So they were sort of ready on the back foot by then. And subsequently, as, as, as now Bruce has said, they've sort of, and, and I guess we'll discuss this in more detail, they've sort of suffered from sure. um, repeated sort of government repression and uh, have continued to sort of struggle to define themselves yeah. and struggle to sort of like shake off the identity of being a sort of Islamist, violent Islamist opposition. Um, as they were during the Civil War. And they've struggled to sort of carve themselves out, sort of legitimate space in, in, in Tajik politics. Hmm. Okay, before to end the first part of the discussions, so war ended after five years, Bruce. 
if anyone came out victorious uh, from this disaster, that person is Rahman. He jumped from a minor position to lead the country, and here you go, after 20 years, he's still in power. So what uh, role did he play in ending the war? Well, his role, as it's described now, is is far more than yeah. I remember it being at the time. Now, now he did go and actually meet one on one with the leader of the UTO, uh, Saeed Abdullah Nouri, on on occasions when talks backed down. But but Rahman, for instance, was not really part of the negotiating team that went to meet with UO UTO officials. Uh, only on a few occasions. You know, that said, he did make. I mean, he went to Afghanistan to meet with Nouri in uh, I think late late December 1996, for instance. So he was willing to take some chances to try to try to push the peace process forward. But there were a lot of actors in this, and, you know, and that's why, like I said, when when I see the news articles now from state media about, you know, Rahman, you know, Peshwai, Mili and, and uh, all the great things that he did, you know, I was covering it. I was in Central Asia in 1992 and three, although rarely in Tajikistan for obvious reasons of this conversation. And then, of course, I started writing about it, you know, in 1995. And I don't remember him having an extremely prominent role in any of these these peace negotiations. In fact, you know, I mean, certainly in 1995, 1996, maybe even early 1997, it was probably, you know, an even bet that he wasn't going to make it very much longer. He, it was a pretty weak government. It was hard to say that he was actually the sole person Person in command of the country, uh, he took advice or was forced to take advice from from a number of other actors, not just only Russia and to some extent Iran, but I mean even within his own government and, and some of his uh, more odious allies from the these Popular Front paramil- paramilitary groups. So uh, you know I do give him credit that that there was some times when he had to go out and meet with some some people that probably would rather have not gone and met with at all. But as far as being like extremely active in promoting the peace process, uh, he left a, a lot of that stuff to other people in his government. Um, yeah. And I know he's taken a lot of the credit for it now, but I remember the day they signed the peace deal and the months leading up to that. And uh, he was one of many, many actors that were mm-hmm. involved in that. Thanks. Yes, the, the war was bloody, disastrous, whether fair or unfair. It ended with a peace accord. And now we are marking 20th anniversary of the accord. We will continue the discussion talking about the legacy of peace accord and today's Tajikistan shortly. Hey everyone, before we get into the second part of the show, just a quick reminder that if you really like Majlis Podcast, there's a real chance that you will also like my other radio show that's called Gandhara Podcast. The show discusses latest developments in Pakistan and Afghanistan from local perspective. And the podcast is published in every second week on Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty's Gandhara website. It's a totally must-follow discussion for foreign policy nerds with interest in the region. First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty Central Asia podcast, we are discussing 20th anniversary since end of the civil war in Tajikistan. Joining me in the discussion are Dr. Edward Lemon, a Tajikistan researcher and postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute of Columbia University. Dr. Noruz Nick Bakhshoyev, visiting scholar at the Russian and Eastern European Institute at Indiana University. Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlog Owozi, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's blog on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis here in Washington, D.C. Okay, so let's talk about peace accord. Uh, walk us through, uh, Nowruz, the process on how the document was signed and what was the main conditions of the accord. It's a really complicated piece of agreement that basically the major components was the repatriation of the refugees and then the reintegration of the uh, United Tajik opposition uh, forces into the government, into the military, I guess, government in quotations at the time. And also, you know, a political uh, power sharing agreement, according to which uh, 30% of the ministerial you know, post the cabinets was supposed to go to to the political members of the United Tajik opposition. So, I mean, these three complicated tasks, you know, in a post-war country, in a country that was amidst the civil war still, it, it, I mean, there were a lot of challenges to actually uh, accomplishing all of these tasks. And uh, one can say for sure that, you know, the spirit of all these this agreements were kind of violated in one way or another, but the government generally succeeded in uh, repatriating the refugees, I mean, together with the opposition forces and the international actors, such as the UN Observer Mission, 
And because as a result of the civil war, just to, re- to reiterate, thousands and thousands, hundreds and thousands of people like sought refuge in Afghanistan, they were displaced. So they had to be brought back. And there were a lot of disagreements, obviously, between the opposition and the government, because it was at that point, it was in the best interest of the United Tajik opposition to kind of have these uh, displaced people in Afghanistan as a potential power base from which to recruit. And then realizing that the government actually then began to kind of uh, facilitate the repatriation because there was also a condition that, you know, these uh, there will be an amnesty, you know, they will be uh, freed from criminal prosecution. By and large, the refugee uh, component of these agreements had a relative success. The military, there were also challenges, and uh, these United Tajik opposition forces kind of were like stationed in different places, you know, as consolidated units without being like interspersed with the Popular Front uh, troops. So over time, they also kind of, their inter- reintegration took place, especially in the, the integration actually succeeded a lot uh, in, in forces that were in charge of the border control, because I guess the unified cause was to protect the borders, you know, from Taliban or other external aggressors. The political, you know, uh, agreement, according to which 30% of ministerial posts had to go to the opposition. At higher levels, I think it reached success. You know, we do see like opposition figures like Mirzo Zyoyev became the Ministry of Emergency and Ojak uh, Bakura Jonzoda became the Deputy Vice President. So uh, by and large, at the top level, at the national level, the political uh, power sharing arrangement was implemented, but it was at the bottom, mid-level, you know, regional level, district levels that it ran into a lot of challenges. So uh, with the passage, in retrospect, one can say that, you know, uh, this power sharing agreement was uh, completely violated because, you know, all the uh, progress that was made was rolled back and in the sense that gradually the the government was able to uh, sideline members of the opposition and to remove them or uh, all positions. And uh, this is the outcome of the agreement, mm. that you have now a, a field that's completely dominated by members of the government. Mm. Even the in my interviews with uh, members of the Islamic Party, they noted that it was before they were actually banned. They noted one of the weaknesses of the United Tajik opposition by pointing out that the reason why they got sidelined because they were too tempted you know, to get government jobs. And we are much more successful because we we didn't get tempted. We instead formed our political party, which is disconnected from the government. So at the time, they were very assured that they're going to continue to preserve their power, even as an independent political party, which didn't come to be. So uh, by and large, we can say that the power sharing agreement in spirit was violated completely. And there's no trace of it right now. Hmm. So Bruce, is there any article of the original peace accord which is still uh, in effect in Tajikistan? No, I, I really can't I can't think of any, and I agree with, with Navruz wholeheartedly that this is, I mean, all of what was written down in the peace accord is, is gone. There's nothing left of that whatsoever. Certainly there's no power sharing in the government. I, we could just go right down the list of any of the things they agreed to, all gone. So, you know, it was at the time I remember it was hailed as a as a major milestone. I remember when U.S.-led coalition started attacking Afghanistan and, and drove the Taliban from power, people suggested that the Tajik model might be a solution for Afghanistan. But now we look at the Tajik model 20 years after it was signed and see that it, it's uh, totally nullified uh, and there is no trace of, of any of those agreements left. Mm. So, Edward, what went wrong with this? Why, why it happened what it happened? Well, I think, as we've already mentioned, you know, when Rahman first came to power in 1992, he was very, they called him the Rais of Rudaki, you know, Rudaki being the main thoroughfare through Dushanbe, you know, the idea being that he could only really control a few kilometers around himself. And as Bruce has said, it's remarkable that he's gone in 25 years from that sort of position to uh, being sort of declared leader of the nation. And I think, you know, he's been, you know, as much as we can say bad things about him, he is a good strategic calculator and has managed to sort of outmaneuver most of his rivals. And obviously, due to this position of weakness, he had to sort of incorporate a number of warlords or commanders into the government and, you know, also sort of sign this deal with the opposition, but has gradually managed to have these senior figures arrested, executed, exiled, and slowly but surely has managed to sort of renege on all of the uh, promises made during the uh, peace agreement. So I think it's a process by which sort of the slow consolidation of his power has resulted in him no longer needing to abide by conditions of the peace deal. 
as he sort of slowly dismantled uh, the opposition. I think Noru's you touched upon this. There is no Islamic party anymore. Where the banning of this party falls in this agreement, and also what happened to the other allied parties in the accord? Uh, who wants to take the question? Bruce, Nowruz, jump in. So the other parties like Mohammad Aziz Kandar, he was the head of the Democratic Party of Tajikistan. That was uh, one other party, and then there was also you know, a socialist party. And but really, after the the peace agreement, the Democratic Party of Tajikistan and the Social Democratic Party is another party that's uh, currently uh, led by, uh, I know the deputy because I get to interview him, Shakir John, and then the Islamic Party. So these three parties, I mean, one of the things I noticed during my time as a researcher for the OECE, you know, when I was like participated during the meetings about electoral reform, it was striking that these parties actually never got together, you know, in a sense, like you would expect them to kind of come to the rescue of each other in case, you know, one party got repressed by the government. So they were always kind of separate. So coordination and cooperation between these parties were almost non-existent. And uh, I guess it's understandable because maybe, you know, the Democratic Party of Tajikistan and uh, the Social Democratic Party of Tajikistan always portray themselves as secular in, in, in character and then to gain more sufficient popular appeal, assuming that there were tremendous worries about the Islamic party coming to power and imposing an Iranian type political system. They always try to avoid the Islamic uh, revival party. On the other hand, the Islamic revival party never actually wanted to uh, to reach out. I guess uh, we was too comfortable with its position as being, you know, authentic. Maybe they feared that they're gonna, by reaching out to other parties, by cooperating with other parties, they might weaken their image. So uh, it's one of the, you know, problems with establishing a democracy, you know, because for democracy to be established, all the opposition parties should should unite, you know, attack on one party should be treated as attack on all the opposition parties. But that was never actually the in the imagination of these political parties. It's like everybody, everyone was for itself, you know, like as a political unit. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's one of the fundamental problems of opposition parties in 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 in, you know, in authoritarian countries. I mean, obviously, the government plays a huge role in playing this uh, divide and rule game. Hmm. Okay, um, we are also reaching to the end of our program today, but talking about the legacy, Bruce, uh, legacy of peace accord, the fact that there is no more uh, trace of it in today's Tajikistan. So, what has been its implication on overall society? Well, it certainly it's provided. A strange base for Rahman to uh, promote his legitimacy for the country. You, you know, you've already read the paper it's, that I wrote, and it's coming out pretty soon on the website. But I mean, it's whenever there's a problem in Tajikistan, and it seems like his Rahman's credibility is at stake, or uh, you know, before ahead of elections or something, they bring up this civil war. Uh, you know, and and show graphic footage of what it was like and, and how horrible it was. Then they talk about the great things that Rahman's done. And so the implication here is that if you don't go for the status quo and vote for the government, you risk going back to this horrible stuff that you've just seen on TV, which was, you know, such a, a traumatic event for the whole country. So uh, in some ways, the, the peace deal and the civil war are the basis for the legitimacy of Rahman's government uh, 20 years after the deal was signed. Okay, to, to end the discussion with this uh, final point, so what was the the greatest lesson from this war, from the legacy of it and its implication to Tajikistan? So let's start with you, Nauruz. Well, uh, the greatest lesson, obviously, uh, as Bruce pointed out, I mean, there's Rahman, you know, tries to capitalize on it by showing these graphic footages, but I think it resonates with people now because, uh, I mean, in the absence of any credible story data, I'm just, my hunch is that it's... Uh, People now tend to appreciate, especially the old generation, I would say, that any political dissent is, has uh, terrible, terrible re- repercussions. Whether that's accurate or not, that's that's just, you know, the thinking now. So I think it has a chilling effect, like, on, on freedoms. I guess that's one of the things. And then, obviously, the government plays a huge role in, in trying to portray the war as such. That, you know, this is, pluralism actually brought the war, and therefore it's bad. And it's more likely to bring another war if, you know, we allow for dissent or opposition. Anyone who challenges the government is considered an extremist. It's interesting, like, you know, the war generally, you know, when you look at the comparative democratization uh, literature, it's just the war tends to kind of usher in democratization. You know, democracy was created on the back of wars and contradictions. But in Tajikistan, it's just the other way around. You know, the war led to closure. And I think in addition to government, you know, manipulating the narrative 
suggests that, you know, this larger environmental factors like, you know, geopolitical factors uh, also play a role. I mean, right now, law and order and uh, security tends to trump, you know, pluralism and democratization agenda. And then the government, you know, authoritarian regimes such as Tajikistan, you know, take advantage of that, of that, you know, international discourse. Okay, Edward, final point, please, on this lesson. Yeah, to speak to Navruz's second point, I think it's, you know, the war, the peace-building process has sort of been paradoxical if we're taking a sort of liberal, we're, we're, we're basing our views on the assumptions of liberal peace, you know, this idea that the only way to build peace is through democracy and, you know, that you can create these sort of legal documents, power-sharing agreements, and they will naturally lead to a sort of pluralism, you know, and I think the tragic case has sort of shown that this... Um, in practice doesn't always work. You know, you can find other forms of peace that, you know, perhaps not as ideal as a democratic peace, but you can have some form of authoritarian peace where there is order and stability to some extent um, without having sort of pluralism. So I think the Tajik case is sort of speaks to that sort of model. Okay, thank you very much for your insight, uh, Dr. Edward Lemon, Tajikistan researcher and postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute of University of Columbia, Dr. Noruz Nekt Bakhchoyev, visiting scholar at the Russian and Eastern European Institute at Indiana University, and Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlok Owozi, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's blog on Central Asia, for your time in uh, Tats today. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And this is it from me, Mohamed Tahir, host of the Majlis, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty Central Asia podcast. Until next week, bye-bye.